And relatively speaking, paleontology is one of the younger sciences, but a lot can change in 200 or so years. Which means that how we see prehistoric animals today has taken and will likely continue to take a lot of metamorphosis as we learn more about them. Now, everyone makes mistakes. So it's not necessarily a case of making fun of those people that came up with these ideas when they didn't have enough to go on. But looking at the following reconstructions, knowing what we know today can be interesting, if not a little funny. So let's take a look at some of the most inaccurate paleontological reconstructions. And this first one is a well-known one, and also one that I'm going to mention with a lot of love, because it is arguably the most responsible for kicking off the popularity of science. But it should be mentioned nonetheless. Crystal Palace is a large park in the southeast of London, and is named as such due to the relocation of the Crystal Palace Great Exhibition from Hyde Park in 1851. This grand building was home to more than 14,000 exhibitions from around the world, boasting countless archaeological and art exhibits, festivals, and much more. With people visiting from around the world, this had essentially become the Victorian Disney World. Many of these showcases weren't just limited to indoors either, with a new exhibition being commissioned for the grounds in 1852, showcasing these strange newly found creatures from a long-forgotten world which the public would soon learn to know as dinosaurs. Now, 15 general were showcased through these life-size sculptures, in which only three are recognised today as true dinosaurs. But among these shown in what was thought as true life positions were Dipsynodon, Temnospondyls, Cenozoic Mammals, Ichthyosaurs, Plesiosaurs, Hyliosaurus, Megalosaurus, and Iguanodon. Obviously the ones closely related to today's animals were accurately represented, but the Dipsynodons were shown as turtle-like reptiles rather than the mammal relatives we know them to be today, the marine reptiles were ripped straight out of Victorian illustrations that showed noodle-necked plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs that looked closer to mosasaurs, and the dinosaurs, well, a side-by-side -side comparison should say everything about how off-target they were. Regardless, I feel that these should remain untouched, since they not only showcase how far the science has come, but we arguably wouldn't have discovered as much as we have about prehistoric animals without these sculptures and the surge of popularity in the science they caused. So our next one is not only one of the very first woolly mammoth remains to be described, but also one of the very first prehistoric soft tissue remains to be described. Back in 1728, British physician Hans Slyne began his extensive work on mammoths, being the first to recognise that these remains may have belonged to modern elephant relatives. Arguments continued about whether or not these were true elephants until the 1800s, when Michael Adams discovered the aforementioned remains. Now, despite the soft tissue remains and the known relationship between mammoths and modern elephants, interpretations from this finding resulted in this. Now, the actual trunk was not found on the fossil, but let this be a lesson to all of those that doubt features on an animal just because they weren't found on a physical fossil. Phylogenetic bracketing exists for a reason. Yes, it is just an inference, but it's easier to count the number of times that it's been incorrect than it's been correct. Otherwise, you end up with a giant warthog thing. Now, here's another one for dinosaurs that is a very well-known one. Right up until the 1900s, dinosaurs were viewed as relatively slow, giant lumbering lizards. And part of that conception was the very reptilian tail that dragged across the floor. Not only did this reflect the reptilian nature of the animals, but it was also necessary since they were interpreted as being a lot more upright. Now, we know better now, so it's not worth spending too much time on, but it is worth mentioning considering how long this notion has held on for dear life. And when you cross a giant ground sloth with a dinosaur, you get therizinosaurs, a clade of theropod dinosaurs which are one of the very few herbivorous ones of this group. Now, despite being theropods, the proportions of this family are weird enough to have led to quite a bit of confusion about what they look like in life. The namesake of this group was the first to be discovered when Soviet scientists uncovered the remains of the infamous giant claws from the Nemeth formation of the Gobi Desert, which was then described in 1954 by Evgeny Maliev. Maliev assigned the genus to a brand new family, but was unsure where to put this family taxonomically, 
since he had in fact interpreted these giant claws as being some sort of giant turtle-like reptile that used these claws to harvest seaweed. Now this was the accepted theory right up until the 1970s when it was suggested that these might in fact belong to a dinosaur. Within and around this decade, other species were being described that were originally thought to be sauropodomorphs or even relatives of Dinochirus, which you can see why. However, in the 90s, the turtles and sauropodomorphs were conjoined with the discovery of Axosaurus and Bapiosaurus, when enough features were seen that were shared with the aforementioned as well as enough to place them within Theropoda. Hmm. I can't actually remember why this one went on here. It looks alright to me. Oh, no. No. Okay. Yeah, now I remember. Now, the old and decrepit like me among you will probably remember walking with dinosaurs, at least until the sequel unleashes it on New Generation. You may even remember having it on VHS. Uh, that's like streaming, except each show or film is in a little box that you've got to rewind every time you want to watch it. Anyway, those that watched this, especially as a kid, might recall thinking that this guy was the absolute biggest predator to ever live in the history of the planet. Lyoplorodon was a plesiosaur, specifically one of the large-headed pliosaurs from the mid to late Jurassic, and it looked more or less how it looked in Walking with Dinosaurs, if you don't look at any sort of scale. The Lyoplorodon we see is stated to be approximately 25 meters or 82 feet long and around 150 tons a size not reached by marine reptiles until just last year with Ichthyotitan. In actuality, this pliosaur likely didn't get any bigger than around 6.4 to 8 meters or 21 to 26 feet and around 2 tons. Still pretty hefty, but not that hefty. As to why a show that was so on point with scientific accuracy for the time in every other regard poured a Jurassic world on us, there are a few theories floating around. Some have suggested that the designers of the show being the silly little Englishman that they are, misread the estimate of between 21 to 26 feet as being in meters and decided to go for the upper estimate for maximum visual effects. Another theory is that they were in full speculation and trusted the very dubious specimens that had estimates of 20 meters or 66 feet long and then exaggerated those sizes with the logic of it being very unlikely that one specimen represents the absolute biggest a species got. But the motivations behind this could be considered honourable since it was probably to start public interest, which is the number one thing that you need when you want to get research funded. Back to dinosaurs with this one, this time one that we are all familiar with. It's difficult to imagine a Stegosaurus looking anything other than, well, like a Stegosaurus. But we need only look at the name to see how different it was. During the late 1800s, an infamous rivalry between paleontologists Edward Drinker Cope and Othniel Charles Marsh sparked what would later be dubbed the Bone Wars, in which many of the famous prehistoric animals that we know today were first named by both parties in a race to be the most renowned. Stegosaurus was one of these, named by Marsh in 1877. He coined this genus name meaning Roof Lizard. This was because he initially thought that these remains belonged to a semi-aquatic turtle-like animal in which the famous back plates lay flat across the back like the shingle tiles of a roof, possibly with the thagomizers protruding from these plates, though no illustration based on this initial description was made at the time. The first official illustration of Stegosaurus in 1884 got a little closer, though only a little bit, showing the dinosaur as bipedal in the upright stance thought to be correct at the time, with what was assumed to be entire rows of phlegomizers running down the back and the plates forming a very crocodile-like tail. But this animal evolved yet again five years later when Marsh published a full skeletal diagram showing Stegosaurus as much closer to the one we know today. Sure, it wasn't 100%, given that the back plates were in more alternating rows and only two pairs of phlegomizers were on the tail, but it at least now looked like a dinosaur that anyone could point to and call a Stegosaurus. Now this next one isn't technically a reconstruction, more of an idea that was put in many people's heads, including mine as a kid. For the longest time since its description in 1970, Dinochirus was a mystery that captured many people's attention, namely because the only known parts of this dinosaur were the arms, and they were massive. These clawed forelimbs measure in at 2.4 meters or 7.9 feet in length, appearing seemingly typical in morphology to the scary claws of other carnivorous theropods, hence the name meaning terrible hand. Thanks to this, Dinochirus was initially classified as some sort of carnosaur, 
alongside the likes of Allosaurus and Giganotosaurus. Now those are by no means small dinosaurs, but they would pale in comparison when you proportionately scale up these guys to the size of Dinocarus' arms. Meaning the members of the public that heard about this were hooked on the idea of finding more of a potentially titanic 50 to 60 foot long predator. Hell, even six year old little me, who wasn't quite as good as I thought at reading, always mistook the word Dinochirus with Deinonychus. So you can imagine my morbid excitement at the terrifying idea of a Dromaeosaur the size of, or bigger than, a T-Rex. But alas, more of this animal was eventually found. First enough to classify Dinochirus as some sort of basal ornithomimosaur, then the full picture showing us that this was less of a vicious predatory behemoth and more of a giant humpback duck. Now if you do want to learn more about Dinochirus and can put up with slightly worse quality in terms of audio and video, I did do a video on it quite a while back here. Now there are a few reconstructions within this category, but I thought I might as well just put them all into one. Pterosaurs are another group that, quite frankly, are so strange that fragmentary remains have led to many wrong assumptions from paleontologists. It was at a time when the idea of evolution and extinction was seen with widespread scepticism, so people were truly stumped as to how these existed. It was first suggested that only one environment could house such a creature, and that was the sea. Johann George Wagler in particular popularised this theory, suggesting that these long front limbs and extreme digits supported wing-like structures that were used as paddles for swimming. Things got a little closer to what we now know in 1800 when another Johann naturalist, Johann Hermann, first suggested to Georges Cuvier that these weird creatures didn't belong to the sea, but in fact the sky. Cuvier agreed that these were flying animals and coined the term pterodactyl, meaning wing finger. This was then Latinized as pterodactylus, which became a wastebasket taxon at the time for most pterosaurs. Hence the notion that still hangs around today for those not in the know of using the term pterodactyl to refer to any pterosaur. Now Cuvier thought that these were some type of reptile, but people still couldn't quite get their heads around such weird animals. So a more popular theory throughout the early 1800s were that these were in fact more associated with mammals, being represented as bat-like flying marsupials. But with what we know about pterosaurs today, the marsupial model is ironically correct in some aspects, even though they are reptiles. For example, the fuzzy appearance that they would have had owing to their pycnofibers. But we are not done with pterosaurs just yet. Now despite how much we know about pterosaurs, there are still some out there that want to reconstruct these animals in radically different ways. And one that comes to mind in particular is one David Peters. Now I am not endorsing hate on this guy, nor do I feel that it is wrong to go against the grain every once in a while. But there is a difference between not following a trend and being a complete contrarian when it comes to scientific consensus that's been proved beyond a shadow of a doubt. This guy probably wore coats when outside in the winter, but then when he found out everyone else was doing it, decided to adopt budgie smugglers instead. David Peters is an infamous paleo artist, mostly known for his skeletal diagrams in the same style as the likes of Scott Hartman. And whilst he has no formal qualifications in paleontology, he's a fairly prominent figure in this world, just not for the right reasons. Now his arguably purposeful mistakes are too numerous to fit into anything less than a full documentary. From making up names for species, to incorrect taxonomic placements, including placing adults and juveniles as different species, and even just doing a flat out poor job of cutting up and putting back together many, many skeletals. That, that bone doesn't even line up with itself. But in the decades that he's been active, his most infamous work has been his many depictions of pterosaurs. Peters has a bit of a knack for seeing things that aren't really there, and not only puts back together these animals in strange and illogical ways that would create a monstrosity with countless broken bones just begging for death, but will also put outlandish soft tissue features for which there is no evidence for or even logic behind in the skeletal diagrams. You know, the diagrams that are there to just illustrate skeletons. To be fair, in recent years he has become a little more reserved and has changed his earlier thoughts, but his work is still flat out incorrect, with Peter seeming to unconsciously care more about being different than he does about science. And that is all I have time for. 
Now, I have enjoyed doing this video, so I'm thinking of doing another one in the future. So if there's anything that I've missed out that you can think of, put it down in the comments below whilst I answer today's question, which comes from patron Demetrius Moritides, who has asked, Hey man, I hope the new year finds you well. It does, thank you, you too. I have a question to ask which may be a bit more difficult to answer this time. We as a species existed for around 300,000 years. Do we know what the oldest living species, not genus or family is? And what is the limit for the temporal range of species before evolution makes it basically impossible to classify the ancestors of a group of organisms under the same phylogenetic brackets as its descendants? In other words, what is the practical time frame limit within which we can still talk about two individuals being as the same species? Okay, I think I know basically what you're saying there, and that is a difficult one. Uh, first up, it's basically impossible to tell what the oldest species actually is. But paleontologists have hazarded a guess at the oldest living species so far, and if we are only talking species, no, it's not sponges or jellyfish. Having been around for a staggering 450 million years, scientists seem to think that the best place to look is with horseshoe crabs, who haven't really changed much in that time. The oldest living genus in this family dates back to the late Cretaceous, but it hasn't been narrowed down to a species just yet. Uh, as to the question of at what point along its evolutionary line is a species considered a different species, I'll be honest, the answer to that question is one I've been trying to ponder for years because paleontologists can't really agree on it. What determines a species by extant standards is whether or not a male and female member can mate and consistently produce viable fertile offspring. But of course, over the many generations involved with the species changing due to evolution, the differences are small enough that breeding is not an issue. So the question remains of where along a group's timeline does a particular species become its own? Problem is, this takes an incredibly long time and we simply don't have the full picture, only snapshots. In order to answer this question fully, we would need specimens for every step of the way spanning thousands or millions of years, or a time machine with a time-lapse option. That way we could log those minute differences until it shows enough to distinguish itself as a separate species, which would still come with the issue of everyone agreeing where to put that point. Or we could use said time machine to look at what point along its evolutionary timeline a member stopped breeding with certain other members. Unfortunately, we humans have a need to label and box up things really neatly in order to get our heads around them. And evolution simply doesn't work that way. There's no single day that a species woke up one day and produced a different one. So where to put that pin will differ depending on what paleontologist is looking at it, and that's if we have the full picture which we likely never will. Much like one is unable to tell when a scene change occurred in a film from just two single frames far enough apart from each other, we simply lack a full enough picture to answer a question which will be different for every single species that has ever existed. Not exactly a satisfying answer, I'm afraid, but it is a very valid question and one that I would also like the answer to. So thank you for that. I'll leave you all to ponder on that until I catch you guys next time.